Welcome back to Cloud Talk Radio by Rashpixel.fm, the podcast that shows do-gooders, nonprofits, and businesses how to build win-win partnerships that raise money and change the world. This podcast is brought to you by Engage for Good and Selfish Giving. You can find full show notes and additional resources for today's episode at engageforgood.com and selfishgiving.com. Now, on to today's episode. Joe Waters, and I want to welcome you to another exciting episode of Cause Talk Radio. On the line with me, of course, is Megan Strand. Hey, Megan. Hey, hey. Megan, we have a great show today. I know, I'm excited. It's all about butter. <laughs> <laughs> and there's an R at the end of that word. And you know how much you love butter. Butter on English muffins, butter on bagels and stuff like that. So to talk about this, Not that kind of butter. this incredible butter. Right. We have on the line with us right now, Rahama Wright, and she is founder and CEO of Shea Yaleen. And she's going to tell us what Shea butter is, because I can't wait to put it on my English muffin. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Rahama, it's not it's not butter, right? It's not. No, butter for English the first muffins, thing I that? need to clarify since. So- Joe is misleading everyone, <laughs> is that, yeah. yes, we do have a product called Shea Butter, but it's not a product mm-hmm. that you put on your English muffin. It's a product that you put on oh. your skin and your hair. Come on, Joe. <laughs> oh, I love that. Hey, it's just where... Joe doesn't have any hair. <laughs> that's I, I, the problem. I don't have any hair, but I have, in, I have incredibly soft skin. Oh, okay. And so <laughs> I'm really into, you know... With, with Shea Butter. <laughs> Rahama, I just turned 50. So I need every tool I can get. <laughs> so I think I'm going to have to double down on what you're selling here. I mean, this is a this is a great opportunity. But I mean, it says here too that not only are you providing great squ- quality uh, skincare products to people, but you're doing it in a way that provides living wages to cooperative members who are living in North Ghana. And I am really impressed by the fact too that your product is being distributed in some great places like Whole Foods, MGM Resorts, and Amazon. Yes. Could you start, though, today by telling us a little bit about shea butter? Is that like a plant or something yep. like that? Do you extract it from a plant? Is that, I mean, tell me how you get, how do you arrive at shea butter and how is that different from maybe other types of moisturizers? Moisturizers. Butter? No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, mm. since you don't have any hair, I'm sure you have skin. So I tell people <laughs> all the time, if you have skin, you need to have shea butter in your life. And uh, shea butter is, comes from the fruit of the shea tree. And this tree grows mm-hmm. exclusively in sub-Saharan Africa in the Sahel region from east to west Africa. And it's, uh, it, wow. it grows on a tree. And the tree, um, it, it, it bears fruit every year, depending on country, uh, between April and August. And women are the traditional harvesters of this fruit. Contained in the fruit is a nut, contained in the nut is a seed, and contained in the seed is shea oil. And that shea oil solidifies at room temperature. I had no idea about this product until I served I, as a peaceful yeah. volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What? Now, so, is- so the fruit itself, is the fruit edible? It is edible. All right. Oh, so that's cool. Wow. So people people eat shea seeds too, or do they spit the seed out like um, a watermelon? A, the seed is actually a bit larger than a watermelon. It more kind of looks like let me see, like that, like an almond, like a nut. Yeah, like an well, not a nut. It, yeah. The seed is contained in a nut, but the oil is a seed oil. I know. So confusing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so the nut kind of remind <laughs> looks like nut nutmeg, and and um, the seed I guess is the size mm. of like an almond. And so the oil is in the seed. And so you eat the fruit and the fruit is kind of like an avocado. You know how the avocado has that large Mm. um, seed in the middle or nut in the middle. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so contained in that (laughs) is so you kind of eat around the seed and uh, sorry, around the nut. And then out of the nut is the seed and you can take out the oil from the seeds. And that's what women do in their small communities in, in, in Africa. That's amazing. Wow, that's cool. Now, did you discover this in the Peace Corps? Um, yeah, I never knew that shea butter came from Africa until I served in West Africa and started learning about shea butter, its origin. I mean, you see so many products globally that have shea in it. You never see it attached to a woman in Africa, even though they're the traditional harvesters. It's an agricultural product. Women are the ones who harvest the, the fruit, they bring it into their communities, they extract out the seeds, they handcraft the shea butter, 
um, and then they use it primarily actually locally as a cooking oil. So you know how over the years, coconut oil has mm. become the rage, especially for, for those mm-hmm. who are doing yeah. like paleo diets. Well, it's kind of the same function uh, shea butter has in a lot of these rural communities. Um, they use the oil as a base for their sauces. They use it as a, as a way to like fry foods. Um, but in the international market, uh, it's also used in beauty products. So shampoos, conditioners, body creams, body scrubs. Um, and that's where Shea Aline plays in. We're looking at how can we create high quality, natural, pure, organic Shea products, bring it to market in a way that's ethical and in the way it's giving women the ability to do things like send their children to school, be able to buy food, be able to invest in other income generating activities, simply by taking a local product, connecting it to the global marketplace, and ensuring that women are able to benefit from the upside of the market. So, so, so wait a minute, wait a minute. The peace, that, code, the peace code, they go to Africa? Are you going to let me Megan, talk in this episode? Megan, didn't you go, didn't you go to the Hamptons Jeez. in New York when you did the peace code? <laughs> close. I went to Honduras. Oh, that's no, right. That's, right. Not, that's really not close. The Hamptons. I, I can see I you thought beginning. you said the Hamptons, not Honduras. <laughs> They're both age for us. Well, I, I'm so impressed, first of all, Rahama, that um, you have created this whole business venture out of something you were doing in the Peace Corps. Now, if I did that, I would be making brick and mud stoves for a living out of my backyard. I don't think they would sell quite as well. So first of all, kudos to you for kind of Thank transitioning you. this into something amazing. But so, I mean, talk to us a little bit, though, about Shea Butter a- a- as it was in the international marketplace when you were there as a volunteer. Like, it did I know that shea butter got out into the world, but was it not sustainably produced? Was it not in women's cooperative models? Like how how did like what was the hole that you saw there? No, as a that's an excellent question. A lot of people don't know this, but even though the raw material grows exclusively in Africa, the majority of shea butter, the actual value added product that's made from the seeds, is not coming from Africa. Over 90% of shea that enters the global marketplace is being made in large seed oil refineries that are chemically processing the shea in these large facilities in mm. Europe and Asia. So that's what you're seeing. That's, that's what horrible. you're seeing when you go to a, you know, a store and you pick up a product and it has with shea butter in it. That shea butter is not coming from a, a woman in, in Africa. Instead, the shea seeds, which is not a value added product, is collected and then exported in large quantities to these seed oil manufacturers. And they're the ones who essentially control the marketplace. So what we're doing at Shea Elaine is actually creating a much more direct connection to the women who are the traditional producers. We do this by organizing cooperatives, providing women with training, giving them access to production equipment, giving them access to capital. And then, of course, we also work with them throughout the production and harvest season to ensure they're creating a quality product. And then we further take the step of taking that product, packaging it, creating our formulas, creating our entire brand, and then connecting it to markets like Whole Foods Market, MGM, and other places. That's incredible, Megan. <laughs> Amazing. We need, we need to send you back to Honduras. <laughs> like, you didn't even, like, what are you doing? We need to start that? over. Yeah, I mean, You're we need perfect. to send you we back there or something. <laughs> I mean, Rahama went to Africa and basically solved like a world problem. Okay. I, mean, I-, <laughs> I need a do-over. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm on your show, so I think you're doing something right. <laughs> Thank you, Rahama. That's awesome. Well, talk to us a little bit about, so you, I think, didn't you originally start a 501c3 to kind of support these women? Like, so how did... How did that go from Peace Corps volunteer to 501c3 to now a for-profit business in Shea Yulene? Yeah, a lot of trials and tribulations and tons of failure. That's how. Mm. Ooh, tell us about <laughs> so, that. So we yeah, want to hear about I that. Mean, you know, I joined Peace Corps right, right out of college. So I knew nothing about business and honestly had no business starting a business. But then here I am. I found myself in this <laughs> village. I'm seeing all these issues and challenges. And then I hear about Shea Butter. And I'm like, wait, we use shea butter in the U.S. Why not? I can help these women. Knowing absolutely nothing about what I was getting myself into. So initially, (laughs) I was like, these women, 
the reason why they're not making money is people don't know about them. You know, these large companies need to Mm. find out about these women. I knew nothing about what I was describing earlier in terms of, you know, the majority of Shea isn't even made in Africa. It's made outside of Africa. And so Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I'm going to start a nonprofit. What my nonprofit is going to do, it's going to organize these women. It's going to provide them with training. Then I'm going to connect them to large companies. And as I was going through that process, I started realizing, well, the issue is not that these companies aren't aware about where these where this product comes from, it's more that they've decided to create a very different supply chain that's not including women Mm -hmm. in a way that's allowing them to benefit from the upside. And honestly, Mm -hmm. I kind of understand it because a lot of these communities that I work in are communities that don't have access to running water, um, communities that don't have access to regular electricity. So imagine you're, you know, you're a large multinational company, you're probably not want not going to want to engage at that level. You just want a raw material. You want to be able to get it. You want, you know, you want to put it in a place where you know that you can ensure quality, where it's consistent and all of these things. And most large companies, that's not just what, that's not what they're built to do. And so as I started Mm -hmm. finding that it was being really difficult getting to, you know, kind of like the J and J's of the world to, to pitch this idea, I decided, well, why not I create something and actually market it instead of marketing it to mass market, be very niche and market it to consumers who care about where their products come from, consumers who care about using something that's natural, that's organic and consumers who actually want to use their buying power to make a positive change in the world. And that's how I kind of pivoted from just doing the nonprofit to actually creating a business model. And I call it a social impact business because the nonprofit Mm -hmm. still exists and is um, kind of the arm of of the model that does the training and the organizing and the capacity building. We have Shailene Bonner, for example, which is staffed by Ghanaians. And then, of course, they're the ones that do the outreach and all of our programming with our cooperative members. And then the Shailene Health and Beauty, which is a profit arm, only focuses on the market link and the market access. And the other reason why I shifted is that Megan, I'm sure you remember this. When you came back from Peace Corps, you didn't have a lot of money <laughs> unless you were wealthy. <laughs> yeah, unless you were wealthy before you went. <laughs> um, and so and you, you get a whopping, we get, what What do you get? $4,000 yeah, for readjustment? Yeah, like something couple, whopping for your two exactly. years of service. And so I had no money. And, you know, lo and behold, it was really difficult getting foundations to support this, you know, woman in her early 20s who was like, this is what I want to do. They're like, yeah, we're probably going to give our money to Red Cross. Like, we're not going to give it to someone like you. But then this whole, um, there was a whole kind of community of investors called social impact investors who are actually looking for people like me who are like, you know, I have this nonprofit kind of feel to my business, but I also want to create money and revenue and help impact people's lives. And so I started learning probably around 2012, I started learning about social impact investors. But in order to get access Mm -hmm. to that type of funding, I would need to have a structure. So I couldn't get social impact investment through a nonprofit structure, I needed to have some sort of profit structure. So I structured the LLC, primarily, honestly, to gain access to funding. Because I was self-funding, I was completely broke. I mean, at one point, I was like crashing in one of my friend's living room, sleeping on her blow-up mattress, <laughs> like twenty dollars in my pocket. All my bank accounts were negative. You know, kind of that. <laughs> There's a song about that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I need to figure. You know, I need to quickly figure out like how can I make this sustainable? How can I actually make this work? So part of that transition. Mm-hmm looking at how to access this type of funding. And in 2014, Mm. I was fortunate enough to get my first round of VC funding through a social impact fund based out of New York. And that has really helped us over the last few years. So when when did you, when were you in the Peace Corps that you actually went to Ghana and met these people? What year was that? So I was in the Peace Corps. Peace Corps from 02 to 04. I was actually in Mali and I actually started my Mm -hmm. uh, business model and started the nonprofit while I was in Mali. But then in around 2010, 2011, there was political instability in Mali. And so I couldn't continue to Mm -hmm. work there. But I had already created connections with Shea Butter Producers in Ghana because I had this idea of creating linkages between producers regionally. 
so Mali, Burkina Faso, and Ghana. And I honestly, like, you know, was trying to do too much. And then after kind of experiencing mm-hmm. some issues, trying to create kind of the sustainability in Mali due to some of the political issues, I decided to just focus in Ghana. And so that transition hmm. happened at around 2012. That's cool. So how do you, you know what I always wonder, Megan, about like social enterprises like this is like, what keeps people going? Like you have been doing this for mm, years and uh-huh. years and years. What, what, what is it? Um, is it just like the, the fact that you wanted to give back that you, you know, you just saw a great idea and you saw a, an opportunity and as you kind of worked on it, like what keeps you going in terms of, you know, really pursuing these ideas. Yeah. One word, insanity. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, (laughs) it's the best way to describe my, (laughs) my current outlook on life. You know, Megan, (laughs) Megan and Rahama, you know who this reminds me of a little while back, we did a show with, uh, Tony's Chocoloni. Remember that one, Megan? Chocoloni. Yeah, yeah Chocoloni. Mm. And they were talking about, and this was a guy who decided to get in the chocolate business, and he was a journalist, and he really wanted to change the business model of how um, chocolate was harvested and used mm. and stuff like that. And he didn't know anything. He didn't mm. know anything about it, and he just got <laughs> into it, you know, and yep. he started working on it and stuff like that. So it reminds me, and I'm I'm always impressed because I'm always like, what keeps these people going in this area? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, well, what keeps I, them mean, pushing I joke when I say insanity, but I absolutely 100% believe that the shea butter industry needs to change to benefit the women mm. producers of who are the backbone of this industry. I mean, I think, honestly, living in my village and seeing so many issues and challenges, but then also... On the other end, because, you know, I am from America, I, you know, I have access to certain resources, even though it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. I just felt like I was able to see both sides, like these women are are struggling, they have these challenges, but then we have people who go to Whole Foods and buy products like these. So I felt like for me, it's like kind of like you see a problem, but you also see a solution. And I cannot Mm. get the solution out of my mind. I truly believe that the world can change. I truly believe that the world can change so that these women can benefit because people want these products. So I think it's a combination of having that belief that it doesn't have to be like this forever. And then also believing that I'm, I have the commitment to see it through. I always, you know, I, I have the opportunity to speak with, you know, college students and young entrepreneurs who want to do something. And I always tell them, you know, it takes time. It takes time to build a brand. It's not yeah. going to happen in two yep. years. I hate that statistic yep. when people say, it, you know, if your business isn't a success in three years, close your doors. I hate that because I just believe that it takes more mm. than three years to build a brand. It takes three years <laughs> just to like right. ramp up. Uh, and yeah. Well, let's, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that though, because this is, this is a conversation we have in the show often. So you have this amazing product that has a very strong social impact story and you have a better way of delivering shea butter in a way that's sustainable and, um, supports these women. However, um, you know, there has to, like the product quality has to be there too. So talk a little bit about like how much when you're selling to a whole foods, trying to get into a new region or whatever, do you sell the quality of the product and the social impact story? Like how does that all come together for you? And what have you learned along the way about those two things? Yeah. So, uh, one, when it comes to pitching to a buyer, it's very different to when pitching to a customer, right? So someone who mm-hmm. you're you're selling the product to at a demo, it's a very different process when you're selling to someone who's actually the decision maker. So I would put I would separate those two, right? Because I found that the people who are the decision makers who are working for these companies, absolutely quality. You want to make sure that, you know, the customer that they're catering to would want to buy a product from your brand because it's filling some sort of need. So filling, you know, I have dry skin, I have eczema, I have psoriasis, my baby has diaper rash, whatever it may be. Um, but then a lot of these companies also want to ensure that they are having a positive footprint in the world. So that social impact side is important to them as well. But I would say the primary is kind of like, well, what's my customer going to get out of this, right? And then when I'm doing a demo and I'm talking to someone or someone from my team is doing a demo, again, 
you really do have to talk about what this is going to do for the customer. But then people buy from people, right? Yes, brands, you know, you know, you, you have to have like a strong brand presence in your marketing or your social media, etc. But at the end of the day, people are buying from other people. People are investing in people, you know. And so it's a very careful balance of like selling the quality of the product, but also creating a brand persona that people can connect to. And I found that my story as an entrepreneur, my story as a Facebook volunteer, um, the story of the women that we work with, we've actually brought the shape producers to the U.S. Um, yeah, and they've gone into a Whole Foods and met with a Whole Foods buyer. They've done a demo and talked to a customer, you know, in, in Dedham and, you know, <clears throat> um, I can't think of other kind of Whole Foods names at this time, but we did it in Massachusetts and Connecticut um, in New York. And so it's, it is a balance. So for me, it's, you know, to quickly answer your question, yes, quality, absolutely. Because then you just sell a story and people buy it one time, they won't buy it again. But if you're selling a good mm -hmm. quality product that's fitting a need, people will continue to buy it. But again, yeah, because I imagine too, Rahana, these buyers are tough, right? I mean, you go in and talk to them, but they need to make sure like, look, your stuff extremely. has to be on the shelf. And when we need more, you got to be able to supply it and stuff. What was your big break? In, in selling your product? Was it Whole Foods? Was it Amazon? Was it MGM? No, actually, um, Whole Foods. And I will say this for, for your listeners who, who, who are you know entrepreneurs and want to try to do something similar, you're going to re get rejected many, many times. So right off the bat, get comfortable with rejection. Actually put yourself in situations where you will be rejected. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. In like the most like crucial way. <laughs> So you can get used to it. <laughs> so, sounds fun. <laughs> sounds, it sounds like being Joe's friend. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was rejected three times. And the first time really hurt. And I was in my feelings when I pitched to Whole Foods. And then, of course, at that time, I wasn't ready. I mean, my packaging was crap. And <laughs> now when I look back, I'm like, what was I thinking? And then I was fortunate enough to hear about this program in the North Atlantic region of Whole Foods, the region that you're in, Joe, um, where the regional mm -hmm. vice president was actually looking for social entrepreneurs who weren't just selling a product, but also had some sort of mission behind their product. And they were doing kind of like an incubator type program um, where they would be helping these entrepreneurs kind of understand how to work with the Whole Foods, understand, you know, how to pitch to a Whole Foods buyer, get advice from a Whole Foods buyer. And so I got into that program um, and through that was able to kind of work with a buyer who helped me through the process. And so after three rejections, was finally able to to pitch and get into seven stores and that and that grew from not only the Na North Atlantic region, but also the mid Atlantic region and the Northeast region. Um, we are now in 114 stores along the East coast. Um, wow. And Holy cow. then of course, what I will say this to everyone, when you're a small brand, Whole Foods is not necessarily going to make you a million dollar business to be quite honest, but what it does, it gives you brand credibility. It gives you, it, you on, the map, on the map. Yep. And I was able to use that. And that's how I got into MGM. And so I always tell right. this to people, don't ever, you know, people are like, oh my gosh, when we were in seven Whole Foods, everyone's like, oh my God, you're making so much money. Da, da, da. I'm like, uh, not with seven <laughs> Whole Foods, but thank you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, there are so many uh, misconceptions. That's but it uh, allows you to open other doors down the road. So, so tell me, Rahma, when you got this order from Whole Foods, were you like, man, I got to call them back in Ghana to see what's, see if we can uh, <laughs> increase production, right? I mean, <laughs> well, the was it, what, there had to be like, you must have, I mean, I'm sure you were ready for it too. Like, I wouldn't be ready for it. You would be, right? You know? And so, so you're <laughs> ready for it and stuff like that, but you get this big order. D was there a sense of nervousness on your part too, though? Not actually, not from the um, the shea per producers because our shea producers have yeah. the ability to produce twenty five tons of shea butter um, every couple of months. Wow! So oh my that gosh. side was not a challenge, and actually, because it taken so long to even get to that point, we had worked out all the issues when it came to like processing and you know training and quality. We test our shea before it leaves Ghana. We test our shea when it arrives. We work with a contract manufacturer that packages our products, and so. You know, they test our products for stability. So all of that wasn't really 
the challenge in terms of the, the supply side. But when I first got into um, Whole Foods, I was working with a different packager and that was just a nightmare where, you know, mm. she, the person that I was working with was missing deliveries and things of that nature. So that was actually more of a concern for me because I was like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> if she's missing, yeah. you scrub my back. Right? Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, it's a long story that I won't get into now, but eventually I had to just move to a different packager. Um, and so that mm. just helped me tremendously. But it wasn't actually the women in these villages that were the issue. It was actually a U.S. based company that was the problem. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. <laughs> these, these people are like, look, we'll give you as much butter <laughs> as you Get want. Your act you know together. I mean? like, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Rahama, this is so fabulous. Thank you so, so much for coming on Cause Talk Radio and talking a little bit more about Shay Yaleen and your story. If people want to learn more about you or Shay Yaleen online, how might they do that? Yeah, they can go to our website, shayyaleen.com. They can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter, where we're the most active. Also at Shay Yaleen, S-H-E-A-Y-E-L-E-E-N. And they can follow me personally on Twitter and Instagram at Rahama Wright. Excellent. We'll include that in the show notes. Joe, where can people find you online if they want to look for you online? Well, I am going right online after this and looking up Rahama Wright and <laughs> following her on Twitter because she's a, a fabulous guest. But people can find me on Twitter at Joe Waters. Make sure to drop by Selfish Giving. Sign up for my newsletter every Wednesday. I send out a, a you know cause tips, cause marketing, everything that's happening in the world pictures of me, etc. I mean, there's all <laughs> sorts of stuff there, right, Megan? And uh, people can find me on Pinterest, too. I'm one of three men on Pinterest, as you know, Megan, so I'm really proud of that. So, <laughs> Pinterest.com front slash Joe Waters. What about you, Megan? Where can people find you? I'm also online on Twitter at Megan Strand, and I tweet for Engage for Good at Engage for Good, which is also where you can find show notes for today's episode, engageforgood.com, as well as selfishgiving.com. And while you're online, please subscribe to Cause Talk Radio on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or Spotify or wherever you get your We're apps. everywhere now. And we're everywhere. <laughs> and on behalf of Rahama and Joe and myself, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Cause Talk Radio. And we'll talk to you next time. 